Hi, my name is Ginger Holt, and I'm going to talk about metastatic bone disease. Metastatic bone disease should be considered in a patient over 50 with a personal history of cancer and atraumatic pathologic fracture. Most likely, this patient has antecedent pain, and all of this occurs in the setting of a lytic bone lesion. Consideration can be given for blastic lesions with breast and prostate cancer as well. In this setting, consideration should then be given for the evaluation of a lytic bone lesion in a patient over 50. Here's an example of a lytic bone lesion. This is a 55-year-old male who presented with left hip and thigh pain when weight-bearing. The arrow shows a subtrochanteric femoral lesion that is lytic in nature, destroying the cortex. This is seen further on the lateral view where there is significant anterior and posterior cortical destruction. When we then think about this lesion by uh, age categories, whether the, the lesion is occurring in a patient less than 30 or greater than 30, there are certain diseases for consideration. Primary bone sarcoma, such as chondrosarcoma, or metastatic disease, like metastases, lymphoma, myeloma, which can be categorized together. Other considerations, chordoma, adamantinoma, giant cell tumor, and Paget's disease. When we narrow this down to a lytic bone lesion, a chondrosarcoma should have a cartilaginous matrix. A chordoma should occur in the sacrum. Adamantinoma is most likely in the tibia. Giant cell tumor would be in the metaphyseal portion of bone. And although Paget's disease can occur in any bone, it has a significantly diff different appearance than a lytic destructive bone lesion. By using this age differential alone, we can narrow this down to the likely possibility that we're dealing with metastases, lymphoma, or myeloma. Here is a radiographic comparison of metastatic uh, disease on the left versus chondrosarcoma on the right. In looking at the lesion on the left, it's subtrochanteric, lytic, and destroying the bone. When we talk about location, tumor bone, bone tumor interaction, and matrix, you can see that the lesion here is clearly overwhelming the bone, and the bone is not responding. In contrast, the chondrosarcoma on the right shows uh, bone expansion as seen by the blue lines. And then when we look at the matrix as shown by the red arrow, there are areas of arcs and rings and punctate calcifications. There's a clear difference in the chronicity of lesions uh, comparing these two. It's important to, to remember that this is the same age category, so this is a common consideration uh, considering a primary bone sarcoma or a prim primary bone tumor on the right and a secondary or metastatic bone lesion such as the lesion on the left. A giant cell tumor uh, also in comparison is metaphyseal. Uh, so if we look on the left, we see the green line showing us the metaphyseal lesion. Again, there's some slow expansion of the bone. So as we talk about the tumor bone and bone tumor interaction, we see that the metaphyseal bone has expanded over time as the interplay between the tumor and the bone continues. On the right, we see that there is a significant cortical destruction. And again, the tumor bone, bone tumor interaction here is such that the tumor is overwhelming the bone so significantly that there's absolutely no response from the bone. You can see small areas and channels where the tumor has uh, begun to destroy the bone, trying to create a soft tissue mass, and certainly displace pathologic fracture through this pathologic area of bone. It also helps that the patient on the right has had a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, and the red arrow is indicating the absence of a kidney, which was from a nephrectomy from a renal cell carcinoma in the past. This is a comparison of a metastatic lesion on the left and the proximal radius. On the right, we see a large aneurysmal bone cyst. And talking about the tumor bone, bone tumor interaction, the lesion on the left is highly destructive. There is no bone response when we're looking at the tumor completely destroying the bone. So when we're comparing tumor bone, bone tumor interaction, the tumor here is clearly winning. The lesion on the right shows a chronicity to it. So what is the tumor bone, bone tumor interaction? Well, the bone has slowly expanded over time and although it's continuing to thin, it is maintaining uh, its ground and keeping the tumor contained. It is also creating small little channels of bone between cystic areas of uh, bone cyst. And uh, in comparing the two, the lesion on the left is highly aggressive and highly destructive. Uh, the lesion on the right is uh, to a lesser extent 
uh, creating destruction of the bone. It also helps in this category that the patient on the left is over 30 years old and, and certainly over 50. The patient on the right is a, a young patient under 20 years old. Again, metastatic bone disease has to be considered in a patient greater than 50 with a lytic bone lesion. And in this instance, we say this is likely metastatic disease until proven otherwise. The general evaluation for metastatic disease includes a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis a whole body bone scan, labs, and a biopsy. And all of this should be performed before surgical fixation. It's an important consideration because a patient with metastatic disease and even myeloma and lymphoma will likely have other disease. Uh, so in a patient who has no other disease and only a single bone lesion, the biopsy becomes far more important. Unfortunately, the patient to the right was assumed to have a metastatic lesion, although his other imaging, CG chest, abdomen, and pelvis was negative, a whole body bone scan was negative, and he had normal labs. No biopsy was performed, and this patient had an intermedullary nail placed to an osteosarcoma. He ended up having to have a large uh, hip disarticulation, removing his limb when he could have had a significant limb salvage surgery that could have changed his life. So only place a nail or fix a, a lesion when you have a diagnosis. Again, the general evaluation of metastatic disease includes a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis, which in the majority of cases locates a primary lesion. When we talk about metastatic disease, we consider uh, the big five lesions, prostate, thyroid, breast, lung, and kidney. And when you're looking for one of these primary lesions, the majority of time they occur in the field of a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis. A whole body bone scan is very helpful to show you if there is greater than one lesion. Remember that a whole body bone scan isn't necessarily helpful in the evaluation of myeloma where it can be cold. But labs can be helpful in this setting with a serum protein and urine protein electrophoresis. If you're evaluating for prostate cancer, uh, PSA may be helpful. But in the end, a biopsy is always the gold standard and the best way to make a, a definitive diagnosis. The CT scan to the right here shows you a large uh, kidney lesion in a patient who had renal cell carcinoma. Here again are the big five um, osteophiles, the tumors that have a predilection uh, to travel to bone, prostate, thyroid, breast, lung, kidney. I like to remember this as PT Barnum likes kids, but some people like to remember a BLT with a kosher pickle. However you like to remember it, doesn't matter, just remember it. It can be helpful in some of these uh, cases if you're considering prostate or thyroid or other disease uh, to perform a specific test. Lymphoma, uh, often these patients do have enlarged lymph nodes, so a CT chest abdomen and pelvis is helpful. Remember a key for myeloma, serum protein and urine protein electrophoresis and a skeletal survey because these lesions are often cold on a bone scan. The last consideration, once a patient has had a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, and appropriate labs is a whole body bone scan. And this can significantly help you. It helps the pathology team when they're trying to evaluate a lesion. As if there are multiple lesions in a patient, the likelihood is that this is a secondary metastatic lesion. It's also, also helpful in a patient if you're determining uh, their staging for a sarcoma. But this is an example of a patient who had a a whole body bone scan, which is what you want to get, not a limited bone scan. And there was disease in the left humerus, left iliac wing, and left femur. Here's a patient who has a lesion in the left uh, lesser trochanteric femur and in the spine. And again, multiple lesions being seen can uh, help significantly in making the diagnosis of metastatic disease. So once you've obtained a CT chest out and pelvis, whole body bone scan, and labs, what would the next step be? Well, as we've sometimes have to be clever in performing a biopsy. The femur is a very common uh, area and location where a biopsy is necessary and it is ideal to obtain a biopsy and review the biopsy in an appropriate setting, not just sending reamings uh, after the case. I've seen reamings get lost, not get sent, or not get followed up on and it is far better to do an appropriate um, prospective biopsy than it is uh, to send tissue afterwards. Here's an example of what you would see on a biopsy when we're talking about metastatic disease, and it is nests and glands. There should never be a time where nests and glands are seen in bone. 
So the histology uh, commonly shows mature lamellar bone, as seen on the left-hand side of the screen, abutting nests or glands, which is seen on the bottom uh, and right-hand side of the screen. Around this, uh, you would see normal marrow or fibrotic marrow. The uh, histology differentiates and can differentiate the type of uh, tumor uh, primarily seen. Now, when the pathologists are initially evalu evaluating this tissue during surgery, they can only tell you that you have a carcinoma or an adenocarcinoma, perhaps myeloma or lymphoma. They can't tell you the specific type of uh, tumor or origin. There's a lot of stains and tissue testing that can be done for that. And here's a comparative uh, evaluation of a, uh, an adenocarcinoma on the left with the nests and glands. You can see the columns uh, lining up around the open mucoid areas on the left. And on the right is an example of a lymphoma. So this patient has essentially a small round blue cell tumor. The cells are small and about the size of a red blood cell. You can see that the lesion on the left is recapitulating a gland, uh, so very similar uh, to the origin that uh, um, it comes from, like colon in this case, or the lesion on the right that actually looks like blood. So this is a hematopoietic tumor. So lymphomas and myelomas that are often uh, hematopoietic in nature actually look like uh, blood or blood elements. Uh, this. Uh, Comparative set of images shows the difference on the left in a giant cell tumor of bone. You see these very large giant cells uh, that sometimes uh, I refer to as big chocolate chip cookies. And then in the middle, you have stromal cells that have the appearance of the nuclei of the giant cells. So it's kind of like a chocolate chip cookie and the chocolate chips that are spread all around. The chocolate chips in the big cookie look the same as the chocolate chips uh, outside. On the right, uh, this is an example of an adenocarcinoma, and you can see these big bunches of glands. So these aren't giant cells. You can see the columns uh, forming uh, their nests and glands of cells. Adenocarcinomas tend to clump together and like to uh, sit together like glands. And a common thing we have to evaluate in patients is infection versus metastatic disease. And here again is a side-by-side -side comparison, looking at the nests or glands of cells on the right, making up sort of columns. Uh, this is a, a clear cell kidney carcinoma. On the left is osteomyelitis with a very heterogeneous uh, cell population. So it's often in the middle of marrow. And in this image on the bottom left, the actual left side of the screen is lamellar bone. Uh, the space to the right is a, a large marrow space that is filled with uh, inflammatory cells, uh, histiocytes, and, and other uh, infection cells. When we consider treatment for metastatic disease, which is very important, we need to think about uh, structural stability. So whether we're treating a pathologic fracture that is uh, displaced or an impending pathologic fracture, it is important to know when these lesions need treatment or don't. So an impending pathologic fracture is a lesion that hasn't actually displaced, but in the setting of lower extremity lesions with any amount of cortical destruction, they have to be fixed. Lesions that are painful most likely need to be fixed, and consideration needs to be given in this setting for the adjunct of bisphosphonate therapy, whether it's pre-op or post-op. If a patient has a known malignancy and is on bisphosphonates, you do not have to alter or change the course of bisphosphonate therapy. When you're treating these patients, you want to strongly treat for immediate structural stability and you want to fix the entire bone if it's appropriate. Bone cement should be used liberally in this setting. And when you're uh, completing the treatment for these patients, the entire bone that has been manipulated needs to be treated. The patient to the right had a humeral nail treated, uh, treating the central diaphyseal lesion. When a nail is placed and a ball tip guide wire is placed beyond the lesion and then reaming occurs, that tumor can be iatrogenic, iatrogenically spread up and down the entire bone. So consideration needs to be given in this setting for radiation of the entire bone. From my standpoint, I rarely have pain relief from the intramedullary nailing of a humeral lesion. I find it is far more uh, important to take these patients, remove and debulk the lesion, uh, treat with polymethyl methacrylate and a plate. It also avoids the problem with having a lytic lesion at the tip of the intermedullary nail as seen here. In considering which patients to operate on, understanding bone biology and carcinoma and how it relates is important. Different tumors have differing propensities to heal. Patients may present as their initial state of disease with only one bone lesion, while other patients have 
may have multiple bone lesions, and their disease may be more easily treated uh, in some settings than others. So it's important to understand fracture healing rates as given here. Uh, lung cancer has a pretty poor rate of healing, whereas myeloma and lymphoma have a significantly better propensity to heal. Now these numbers are given uh, his historically uh, in the 80s. Uh, currently patients live a lot longer with metastatic disease because we have targeted therapies. We have better uh, treatment with bisphosphonates. So consideration has to be given for all of these things when considering how aggressively one treats disease. So as we talk about bone biology, it's helpful to also look at the vicious cycle that creates lytic bone lesions. And it's important because there are two drugs that can be given to help this process. If we look at the vicious cycle, the tumor cells are at the bottom, or six o'clock on this uh, cycle. The tumor cells are uh, induced to produce factors that really stimulate the osteoblast to produce rake ligand. So the tumor cells produce PTHRP, TGF beta, VEGF, and other factors that really get osteoblast to overproduce rank ligand. Now normally the osteoblast sort of control this by producing osteoprotegrin. And I, I put these factors in here so you can see them in case they end up as their own decoy on your examination. So the tumor cells rev up the osteoblast to produce rank ligand. And that's important because the rank ligand uh, not only has a, a specific uh, block, which is a human monoclonal uh, inhibitor, which is denosumab, but uh, when the rank ligand is, is also revved up, it uh, gets the osteoclast uh, overproducing. And um, bisphosphonates can also help in this vicious cycle because they induce aptosis of the osteoclast. So this not only stops the osteoclast from inducing lysis, but it also uh, puts a bridge into the vicious cycle because the osteoclasts don't create as much bone resorption and therefore don't create as much uh, local factor on the tumor cells to create the factors that uh, induce increased rank ligand in the osteoblasts. Now currently one or the other drug is used. Most commonly bisphosphonates are used, but uh, more and more commonly we're seeing denosumab uh, which has the trade name of Exgeva or Prolia uh, being used in this scenario. Bisphosphonates, as we know, have a, a problem with inducing long-term uh, use in fractures, and it is hoped that uh, denosumab uh, eliminates this uh, uh, problem. So we're now seeing patients use denosumab more uh, for the uh, inhibition of lytic bone lesions from metastatic disease. But I put these on here and show you this vicious cycle because this is a, uh, an emerging test question uh, for the future. It's also helpful to use a, a couple of uh, tools that we have, the Harrington classification and Morell's classification. The Harrington classification is a little bit older and a lot more simple. And it says that a patient who has 50% circumferential cortical destruction, uh, a lesion that's two and a half centimeters or greater, especially in the proximal femur, a lesser trochanteric avulsion or persistent pain following radiation is a patient who needs surgery. Uh, this does talk about the proximal femur as far as location and, and Morell's, uh, which was published after the Harrington's classification, got a little bit more specific and actually tried to give a score. So uh, Morell's classification looks at the site, what the pain is like, what type of lesion you're dealing with and the size. And this uh, sort of is a way to break down what we talked about before in understanding the cancer and the cancer biology. Uh, these are then given a score based on location, pain, uh, the type of lesion and size. It's also uh, uh, important to note that this is a general guideline or classification. It's hard to say that a numerical score that's as tight as this, uh, going between a 7 and an 8 and a 9, uh, can give you the entire answer uh, as to whether to take a patient to surgery or not. But it's helpful, and again, in putting this together with the overall picture of the patient uh, may lead you to a better decision as to whether to treat the patient surgically or not. Here's an example uh, using Morell's classification. Uh, this is a 57-year-old female with lung mats to the femoral neck. Uh, the location here is uh, peritrochanteric. The patient has functional pain, so the patient says to you, yeah, I have pain when I walk, take a step, turn over in bed. The lesion here is clearly lytic, and when you look at the size of the bone involved, uh, the lateral view shows you even better that this is, this is at least half of the femoral neck. So on the uh, uh, classification scale, this is uh, a total of 11 on the classification scale. And this patient did uh, benefit from surgical treatment. Spine is a separate entity from the long bones. 
and uh, consideration has to be given for cord compression and a neurologic deficit. Patients who have compression or instability uh, cannot recover these issues. So uh, a patient who has persistent pain in a mechanical source really uh, should be considered for uh, uh, surgery. So if there's cord compression, spinal instability, or persistent pain after treatment with a, a treatable source, these patients need sur surgery. Now, you have to exclude some lymphomas, leukemias, myelomas, and germ cell tumors because they are extremely radiosensitive, and this is a patient who may need immediate treatment by the radiation team to alleviate uh, pressure. But you have to remember the cord will not come back. So, um, unfortunately, uh, patients who have osteosarcomas, Ewing sarcomas, and, and other tumors, the actual uh, treatment for a patient with a declining neurologic status is decompression. Here's an example of the compression you may see with a tumor. And again, understanding uh, the pathology can be important for these patients because you may avoid uh, a large and necessary surgery if you have the diagnosis. So here's a case example. Here's a 65-year-old woman with right groin pain. She tells you she has pain with weight bearing and she has no prior medical history. Immediately the eye is drawn in these x-rays to the intertrochanteric, subtrochanteric lytic lesion in the bone. Immediately in a patient over 50 with a lytic bone lesion, consideration should be given for metastatic disease. Remember prostate, thyroid, breast, lung, kidney, myeloma, lymphoma. The lateral view shows an even more compelling case. This is a lytic destructive lesion of the lesser trochanter, and a lesion of the lesser trochanter, lytic in nature, should be considered pathognomonic for metastatic cancer until proven otherwise. Here on a better comparison view on the uh, AP pelvis, when you are looking at the left hip, you see a nice outline of the lesser trochanter, but when you look to the right side, you can see this is completely absent. In the workup of this patient, CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, and whole body bone scan, the bone scan is quite revealing for multiple, multiple lit, uh, lesions throughout the ribs, pelvis, uh, and even the uh, left fibula. The CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis is quite revealing. It not only shows a lesser trochanteric fracture uh, by the blue arrow, but it also shows blastic lesions in the bone in this 63-year-old woman. So in a patient with a pathologic fracture of the lesser trochanter, multiple blastic bone lesions, the most likely diagnosis is metastatic breast cancer. I want to go through some controversies in fixation of pathologic fractures. As we all know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. But I think as orthopedic surgeons and people treating bone lesions, we often tend to take these from a perspective of trauma and the trauma that we're used to taking care of. But this is a very different patient population and requires very different thinking because the bone lesions from metastatic disease do not heal. And so the treatment that may work very well for a patient with normal bone biology and a fracture very well may not work in this patient population. Uh, the treatment of a mid-shaft humerus lesion uh, can vary. Some people may treat this with an intramedullary nail. As I've mentioned, uh, I find this treatment methodology less than ideal. Patients continue to have pain. There is a higher rate of failure in these lesions uh, because the lesion itself is not addressed or treated. Um, and currently, because these patients live a, a lot longer than they did previously, it has uh, begun to appear that debulking these lesions, cleaning out the lesions, and minimizing the disease will help radiation therapy, helps bisphosphonate therapy, and actually helps patients to do better. Here's an example of a displaced a mid shaft humerus fracture with a very large lytic lesion. And this patient was treated with polymethyl methacrylate and a very long uh, plate. And this patient uh, has immediate full weight bearing of the arm. The arm is immediately structurally stable. And this patient goes into soft dressing and is allowed to fully use the arm. Uh, less radiation can be given to this patient because the lesion has been completely curetted and removed and debulked. And the patient have a, has a much better chance uh, of healing. But if the patient doesn't heal, the rebar provided by the cement gives this patient much better stability. Uh, this is a, a further example of a uh, potential for treating a metastatic disease. 
There is some data to show that complete radical resection of renal cell carcinoma can actually improve patient overall survival and should, should be performed when the patient has a long hiatus between disease. And this is an example where something like that may be used. The intercalary region of bone is removed and then the ends are cemented with this intercalary modular oncology replacement segment piece. So the humeral diaphysis uh, can be controversial uh, because a lot of people like to use a nail or do you, do you want to use a plate or PMMA? And although a nail provides whole bone fixation, it doesn't allow for tumor debulking and it actually doesn't provide for full stability of the bone. On contrast uh, to this, a plate with polymethyl methacrylate allows for better uh, biomechanical fixation and allows you to reduce tumor burden uh, and, and especially provides better control for less radiosensitive tumors. And this has been shown biomechanically uh, in the setting of uh, a plate, a plate with cement, uh, a plate with full cement fixation, and then plate fixation, uh, and a nail, and a nail with uh, cement fixation. So the important concept here was that the strongest construct is uh, placing cement throughout the bone, holding the fracture fixed, and then placing a plate with screws throughout. Uh, this had the best torsional stiffness, failure torque, and failure. And here's an example uh, that could be controversial. A patient with a uh, lesser trochanteric lytic lesion uh, on the left, uh, AP view, and the lateral view on the right shows potential disease extension into the intertrochanteric femoral region, but the majority of disease appears to be below the trochanter. And this patient was treated successfully with an intramedullary nail. Then in contrast to that, a patient with a large proximal femoral lesion extending from the base of the neck through the intertrochanteric femoral region down to the lesser trochanter has a very large substantial lesion. Now there is a temptation to put a femoral nail in this, but considering that you probably have maybe three uh, centimeters of fixation for the nail, this patient is very likely to fail their nail, have persistent pain after surgery, and a, a very high chance of going on to be treated with a modular oncology prosthesis. This patient is far better treated from the outset uh, with a, a modular oncology prosthesis than to undergo the uh, nail intermediary. This is a consideration uh, in a patient who probably won't need radiation therapy because the, the lesion has been completely resected. And although the margins may be called positive on pathology, uh, the likelihood is, is that the macrometastatic disease will be controlled by further uh, systemic therapy. So we talked about this before and how important bone biology is. And here's an example of a patient who presented with lymphoma. Now lymphoma is one of the small round blue cell tumors that will uh, creep out of the bone through the reversion canal system and, and through the small channels with minimal destruction of the bone. In a patient who has a good solid foundation of bone uh, in a blue cell tumor uh, like lymphoma may successfully uh, undergo treatment without surgical fixation of the bone. This 23-year-old woman had a lot of uh, comorbidities and, and complicating factors and uh, was placed in a splint and a boot and underwent uh, her full, full course of uh, chemotherapy. And at the time, the bone successfully healed and she completely uh, was able to avoid surgical fixation, which, which was certainly ideal in her setting. It is now commonplace that lymphoma is treated systemically with chemotherapy, no radiation therapy, uh, if the uh, underlying structure of the bone uh, can successfully support this course. Another controversy that exists is using long stem versus short stem uh, hemiarthroplasty and whether you use cement or no cement. Uh, here's an example of a patient who had metastatic breast cancer. You can see the very large cage fixation. And she had a long stem cemented hemiarthroplasty place. And I was glad uh, uh, in the end, uh, once she started developing disease down the bone, that you can see the lytic lesions at her entire femur was prophylaxed. And this is a very good example of why this occurs. But again, in today's setting and population, the patients have such good systemic therapy. They have a much uh, longer uh, lifespan. These long stem cemented hemiarthroplasties create a very large uh, cement bolus and fat emboli and have uh, a very significant rate of complications. So although we've talked a lot about lytic lesions, uh, I, I did mention before breast cancer and prostate cancer uh, should be considered um, when we do see uh, lesions in bone. Now uh, the blastic portion of the lesion may make you think osteosarcoma. So in a patient who is over 50 who has a, a blastic sclerotic lesion, 
uh, you know it's highly unlikely that they're going to have an osteosarcoma, but this is where the workup of this patient becomes extremely important. Getting your CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, looking at the whole body bone scan, and performing a biopsy, especially uh, if there are no other lesions. This patient uh, immediately by local evaluation by MRI scan was shown to have multiple underlying uh, marrow lesions, giving the uh, diagnosis of metastatic uh, disease. And the CT scan shows the very sclerotic nature of the bone uh, seen in the left proximal femur. You can also see some of the blastic lesions in the left ischium. So here is the whole body bone scan in this patient that shows multiple, multiple osseous metastatic lesions. The left proximal femur, of course, is the biggest and brightest, but uh, this level of disease in a patient with a sclerotic bone lesion is very helpful. When you take this patient to surgery for his proximal femur and you do a biopsy, or if you do this as a core biopsy, it is very helpful for the pathologist uh, to see um, this sort of pattern and the likelihood that this is metastatic prostate cancer in a, this patient. And this is a patient that's extremely important, as I noted, to go through your workup. A patient over 50 with a lytic or, or a concerning blastic lesion, getting a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, uh, most likely will determine the, the uh, source. A fracture or avulsion of the lesser trochanter is pathologic until proven otherwise. And then performing your CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, whole body bone scan, getting your labs, and the all-important biopsy. And remember, how you uh, perform a biopsy is extremely important. When you suspect a metastatic lesion and the option of biopsy is given, choose a biopsy. Now, this refers to any uh, examination, but it also should occur in life. Uh, if you haven't got a diagnosis, you shouldn't treat a patient. Although metastatic disease knows no boundaries and can occur in any location, it's typically destructive, most likely is lytic, but certainly prostate and breast cancer can be blastic or mixed lytic plastic. It is helpful when you see a destructive lesion in a patient over 50, distal to the elbow and knee, that this is usually a lung or renal primary. The number one choice would be lung, the second choice would be primary, uh, renal primary. Now it's easy, today lung cancer is the most commonly uh, diagnosed uh, carcinoma in the United States. Uh, and so the likelihood is that you're dealing with lung with many carcinomas, but lung has a propensity to occur below the elbow and below the knee. So it's uh, important in conclusion, uh, again, to know the workup of patients with a, a, a lytic bone lesion or a mixed lytic blastic bone lesion over 50. Metastatic bone disease is extremely common. It will be seen in anyone's practice uh, on multiple occasions and having a good understanding of how to diagnose it and how to treat it is critical. Thank you.